Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to our week eight, uh, week seven SPAM seminar. And our guest speaker today is Oliver White, who is a PhD in mathematics. So he will be talking about what does gas has to do with elections? A brief introduction to interacting multi-agent systems. So Oliver, please. Thank you very much. Um, so my talk today, I just wanted to do sort of a general introduction um, to the dynamics of large numbers of complex individuals uh, from the approach of sort of kinetic theories of gases. Um, and I've split the talk into three sections. And the first one we discussed that are the general concepts of the, of the kinetic theory of gases. Uh, in the second one, we will discuss uh, the socioeconomic settings, so the, the setting that gives it, brings us towards closer to the uh, elections. And in the final one, uh, you'll see my results that I get from the uh, results that I have from the uh, models that we generate. Um, in the kinetic theory of gases, we treat each of the individual gas atoms or whatever, just as simple basic particles that uh, interact with each other by hitting and bouncing off uh, in the way that we expect they would do. And we then we look at the evolution of that population over time. Uh, to help with this process, obviously, we need to assign some parameters to our gas particles. Normally, we consider the centers of masses of the particles and the speed at which those particles, or the velocity at which those particles are moving. But when we move to socioeconomic ideas, we tend to think of them as wealth or opinions on a subject or something similar to that. Uh, we also generally make the assumption that our gases are sort of rarefied, so that all the particles are very far apart, and that the actual collisions between particles are quite rare, although this helps to say uh, this, this helps us because it means that collisions between more than two particles are very unlikely. So we can just consider the two particle case. Um, so we specify the uh, so for a uh, for two particles, uh, we say that they hit each other when they are with when their centers of masses are within two radii of each other, however large the radii of the sphere is. And this is basically saying that they are touching, at least touching each other. Uh, and when they actually meet, we have them rebounding according to this rule, uh, i.e. bouncing off each other, where the uh, Xi1 star and Xi2 star are the, sort of the post interaction, the post collision velocities. Uh, it's important to note that these that this in this situation, these represent sort of rebounding or repulsive interactions between individuals. Um, in terms of the socioeconomic context, um, we generally discuss the idea of having, uh, well, let's assume that we have a, a, some kind of issue that has two sides and most people will exist somewhere on a spectrum between those those two extremes. So. Uh, in an election in America, say, you will have uh, Republicans and Democrats, and most people will exist between the extremes of the Republican and the Democrat, but they will generally vote one way or the other. So we tend to discuss the opinion as an actual real number that exists on an interval. Uh, and then we say that the one endpoint represents the extreme against opinion and the other endpoint extre the extreme for opinion. Um, if we take two individuals that just have two, some opinion in our interval, then we can place some conditions on how we want them to actually interact. Uh, and this simplify a lot of the very complex behaviours between conversations and people talking. And the first condition is that we we want these these sort of interactions instead of acting like bouncing off each other in, in gases, we want them to act more like they are pulling each other towards each other. They're, they're pulling each other towards. Uh, they're compromising on their beliefs. It's very rare that 
two people will interact and will end up more extreme in opposite directions than they started. Uh, secondly, we are uh, assuming that, that if two people are very different in their general beliefs, they're not going to um, compromise at all. So a diehard Republican will not interact very much with a diehard Democrat, for example. Um, and lastly, we assume that in the intervening time, there's some effect that, that some sort of random effect on the opinion. So um, something that like the media affecting them or them just sort of thinking about the conversation, some some just some random effect afterwards. So we could write our interactions as as these interactions uh, where W star and V star are sort of the opinion after they've actually interacted. Uh, and in these interactions, we have uh, this gamma, which is a, sort of the speed at which, or the amount at which they will compromise. Um, this p function, which we normally choose to be a characteristic function, it, it's encapsulating the second, uh, uh, the first condition and the second condition. That is, that it's allowing them to interact with each, uh, to gain, get closer to each other, and it's also um, it's also setting out a radius in which two individuals must be in order to actually interact. Um, and the last term is just some centered low variance random, random variable, which is multiplied by this D function, which is just simply something that it, it uh, minimizes the effect of self thinking on extreme opinions. And this is just mostly to keep opinions inside the uh, the actual interaction very uh, interval that we've chosen. Um, although this model is ostensibly a continuous time model, so when you think of gases that they they go towards each other and they bounce off each other in continuous time, we it's advantageous to think of these in just the pure discrete steps since there are only interactions. They they only the velocities only change when they actually hit each other and then bounce off. That's the only time that we really get these uh, changes to our thing. So we talk about this in discrete time. Um, we discussed that the, because of the way this all works out, because it doesn't, uh, when, once they've interacted, they don't really interact again unless they hit each other later on. We can discuss this as a Markov chain. Uh, which has a distribution function that specifies the whole population. Um, considering only one and two particle marginals of that total distribution function and making the assumption that uh, the one particles have no correlation, that's the idea that once they've hit, they have nothing to do with each other, uh, we can generate a Boltzmann equation, a Boltzmann type equation by taking the limit as our population size goes to infinity. Um, and this, this, it's discuss, uh, this equation discusses how the, uh, it discusses the evolution in time, and it has this P that represents the effect of these interactions. And this P function sort of encapsulates the idea of, um, gains inside a an in, a interaction radius and losses outside that interaction radius over time. Uh, and then using a, sym a set of symmetry arguments, we end up with this specific form of the, the interaction operator. Um, although here is perfectly good to stop and would be very useful in a lot of situations, finding numerical solutions to, to this Boltzmann equation is relatively slow since we have to use um, direct ways to use Monte Carlo simulations for it and convergence Monte Carlo simulations are very slow. So instead we would want to look at this as a, a PDE, a true PDE that depends only on the actual interaction, uh, that does not depend on the interactions themselves and just generally gives us the idea of the uh, population. Um, and this process is long, it's not 
particularly complicated, but it is quite a long process, so I'm not going to discuss it here. But in broad strokes, we take the weak, weak form of our Boltzmann equation and we substitute in the interactions into that, then use a specific type of time scaling uh, and then take a quasi invariant limit of this, which is effectively taking the speed of the particles to zero and reducing the random effect to zero, whereas keeping this kind of this coefficient constant, that constant, constant. Um, and this leaves us with this somewhat nasty looking um, Fokker Planck equation, um, which we also, because we ended up going through using weak forms we've actually ended up with uh, an integration by a, a set of boundary conditions which have resulted from our integration by parts um, we also have ended up with these two operators k and m and k is this convolution operator that is representing the concept of this p function that we ended up that, that we had in our interaction step um, and this m function is just the it's the mass of the population uh, at time s. What's somewhat important to notice here is that this is a PDE that it's a non-local advection diffusion problem, and the numerical solutions of well, numerical methods that are used to solve this tend to be a lot faster than the Monte Carlo simulations. So it's quite useful for these general models and it takes a lot less time to run. Uh, now that we have the general idea of how to come up with these Fokker Planck equations, uh, we can we can now discuss other similar models. Uh, and here we can discuss the, the model of Turing et al, which has it's a similar one, but instead it allows us to have two different types of species. So we have a leader species and a follower species, which are, they can interact, but they don't necessarily, uh, well, they interact differently with each other. Um, the interactions we have is the idea that uh, it's similar to the idea of uh, small particles and large particles. So a leader is a similar to a large particle where if you have a small particle colliding with a large particle, the large particle will remain on a very similar course, whereas the small particle will rebound a lot faster, uh, whereas two large particles will interact the same as two small particles, for example. So it's similar to this mixture of gases idea. Um, and in my current uh, research, what I'm actually doing is I'm um, extending these ideas by taking uh, inspiration from some other uh, pre-election polling uh, concepts. Uh, we are treating uh, sort of diverse demographic groups as separate species of gas. So uh, we came up with a general solution for N species. Uh, and then we chose to run these uh, this model on something simple, so something like the 2019 general election in the UK. Uh, and obviously we can't use a hundred, or we didn't want to use a hundred species, so we chose to, to reduce ourselves to eight follower and leader, uh, eight follower species and one leader species. And the species that we chose were uh, 18 to 24 year olds voted leave, 18 to 24 year olds voted remain, so on and so forth. Uh, and we chose these because age tends to have a very big effect on elections and we thought uh, the the work of Lord Dale as well said that the uh, the vote in Brexit was one of the most important parts so we decided we'd see what would happen if we just used only the 24 year old or the age and uh, leave and the, the result of the referendum um, and we ended up with eight follower species because we simply had four groups of uh, four groups of age and two groups of uh, leave or remain. Uh, and the last thing that we did that was different to the previous ones is we defined the idea of party boundaries. So we partitioned our interval 
in such a way that every party had a subdomain where they could influence the individuals that were in that subdomain. Um, so with that, with that general concept, we, we thought we'd look at uh, the Red Wall in the north of England, which is a traditionally Labour voting area. But in the 2019 elections, large swathes of it voted for Conservatives. I think it was called the falling of the Red Wall. So we have run our simulations in uh, Nottinghamshire in the East Midlands. And the reason we chose this one is because it has some that didn't change over the election and the constituencies of uh, Ashfield, Mansfield and Bassett Law were all a part of this Red Wall uh, that all swapped to the uh, to voting conservatives. Um, so these here are the results of the 2015 general election and these were our um, initial conditions for our model. And uh, here we've used red to represent Labour and blue to represent Conservative, although we did model the other parties, they're just none of them have won any of these uh, these constituencies in the 2015 general election. Um, so the only data we really had access to was the uh, 2011 census data, the results of the 2017 general election, and we had the uh, the voter intention from just before the, the 2019 election, um, which we then used all those three to uh, define the influence of our leaders over the followers within their uh, influence area. Um, the results we got are presented on the right, and we have uh, we generated a uh, the top the top graph here is the the actual results of the election, and the the uh, bottom ones are our results that we got from our simulation. Uh, and as you can see, the 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 maps look very similar, although we didn't have very good. Uh, we didn't predict the intensities of the win correctly or any of that, but we at least got the swapping, which is very encouraging. And it's very encouraging since we the data we had is quite old at this point. Um, so that, that was really good. Uh, oh, I run out of time. <laughs> ah, sorry. Um, and so here's just a close up of our our final results. And here is the initial conditions that we actually worked for. Um, and then there are references. OK, thank you very much. Sorry, that one is what so, I wanted. Yeah, so before we move to the uh, Q&A session, let's unmute ourselves and applaud for uh, Oni Wright's interesting talk, please. Recording.